Several years ago, I was as anti-aligner as anybody you could ever meet. And then I had the opportunity to watch today's guest at a conference. He showed me what one could do with plastic and how you could achieve the same results with aligners as you could with brackets and wires. He was generous with his time and has helped me realize how to implement plastic in my practice in a way I never really imagined possible. You've seen him speak, you've seen his cases, and as I always tell you, buckle up or grab a drink or get on the treadmill, but whatever you do, you do not want to miss my time interviewing Dr. Jonathan Nicosesis. Hey there, everybody. It is Dr. Glenn Krieger here uh, with another episode of the Orthopreneur's Podcast. And today we have uh, a friend, uh, a name you know, somebody who's taught me a huge amount about plastic uh, and changed the way I practice, uh, Dr. Jonathan Nicosesis. Welcome. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you so much. Absolute pleasure to have you here, really. Um, before we get started, I just had one question I want to ask you. Sure. How about those New York Giants, huh? <laughs> oh, you know what? It, they are the, uh, the the gift that keeps on giving in the NFC least. So you know, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to thank you for taking Golden Tate off our hands. And, uh, you know, I think I'm one of the few Eagles fans that, believe it or not, I truly believe I'd rather keep Nick Foles for a solid five, six years uh, and trade away Carson Wentz. I love Carson. No disrespect for him. He's terrific. Hey, Carson, but, if you're listening, he doesn't mean what he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Nick Foles, man, I mean, you go with the proven entity that that can be the clutch player that is uh, leadership. And um, I don't know, five, six years of, of solid uh, deep into the playoffs to me means the world rather than, you know, 10, 12 years with somebody who may – look, anybody can get hurt. Don't get me wrong. But uh, I don't know. You, you, you go – you go with your proven entity. That's the way I look I at it. I agree. And so for those of you out there who don't know, um, I grew up a huge Giants fan. In the NFC East, you know, our rivals, arguably, I would say, <laughs> are the Eagles. I mean, I, I don't like the Cowboys. Don't tell anybody here in Dallas that. The Cowgirls. Uh, and, and I'm not a big fan of the Redskins, but they're relatively irrelevant the last uh, 40 <laughs> or 50 years. It's Doug Williams. I was in college when Doug Williams was playing. Right, and, right. And, um, and the last few weeks have shown – that the New York Giants have a plan, which is no plan, which is the <laughs> gift that keeps giving to Jonathan. So for unless something really changes and Gettleman is a genius, um, the next four to six years are going to be very tough for those Giants fans out there. And, and the reason I give him such a hard time uh, is because this man is a traitor. He practices in New Jersey, the, the home of the New York football Giants, yeah, yet, right. yet he roots for the Eagles, the lowly. But, Terrible. Vysikahema <laughs> Eagles. <laughs> well, listen, understand New Jersey is such that it's really broken up into north and south. And, and being in Princeton, we are like in the central, which really is a, a, a true hodgepodge of, of sports teams. And so as soon as you head further south, it's all about, you know, Cherry Hill, Philadelphia area and, and farmlands. And up north are just the rude people in, in North Jersey that are more akin <laughs> To being Giants fans, so oh, uh, that just hurts. In 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 Central New Jersey and Princeton, we are truly the, the sophisticates of the state, and um, you know we, we kind of rise above all that. We would call you bourgeois, thing. perhaps might be another <laughs> word. But um, but joking aside, um, uh, John Jonathan is one of my favorite people in orthodontics because oh, thank you. Uh, he always speaks his mind. Uh, you're always going to know where you stand, and quite frankly, you know I love the fact that you're pushing many of us, uh, me, myself, at least, uh, somewhat uncomfortably mm -hmm. into the plastic field a couple of years ago when my vision was that, you know, a lot of patients weren't candidates for aligners and right. you showed me how they were. And then we'll get into all of this in a little bit. So you know what my first question is going to be here because you've listened to the podcast. <laughs> Take a little bit of time. And if you don't mind explaining to everybody here uh, a little bit about, you know, how you became an orthodontist how you ended up um, practicing where you are, and uh, get us up to speed a little bit, if you don't mind. Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, you know, I'd like to take a different slant on this, if you will. You know, you you are uh, the fearless leader of orthopreneurs, entrepreneurship in orthodontics. And I think that I, I'm here today where I am in many different aspects of my career, which I'm, I'm truly uh, 
blessed to, to have, which I'm going to share some of my experiences. And, and the reason is, is it all relates back to the fifth grade where I asked my parents for a BMX bike and they told me no. And, and so I'm here to, to really instill upon the power of no, the word no, as a true motivator, as something that, um, you know, when you're told no, you, you, you can, and it's not about proving people wrong or, or saying, I told you so I could do it anyway. It's about being told no and, and really using that as um, inspiration, uh, motivator to get what you want anyway and to do it properly. And so, you know, in the fifth grade, my parents said, no, you can't have a BMX bike. Use your brother's Schwinn with a banana seat. And, uh, and I, <laughs> I remember said, that one. hell to the no. And, and so what I do, I, I went out and I got myself a paper route. And it took me six and a half months uh, to raise $425 to buy my Skyway BMX bike that weighed 16 and a half pounds. And I had- I love that bike, by the way. Did that, did that have a shifter in the middle? It, it, no, it didn't have a shifter. And I used to race BMX bikes for my local bike. And it was a, uh, you know, it, it was just, I, I made it nice and light. And, and I basically got it because I wanted it. And I figured out a way to earn money in the fifth grade. Nice. And, and and so the power of no is a truly motivating factor. Uh, and and by the way, we still have that bike in my parents' basement in, in Lancaster County. Uh, but you know, continuing <laughs> continuing on, you know, I was never the the brightest uh, in high school. Uh, but I'm always the one to to work the hardest, if you will. And, and I, I'm one of those people where I, I cannot be outworked by anybody else. And so uh, when it came time to applying for college, um, I chose to apply to Lehigh University among many. Uh, and my guidance counselor is like, well, it's kind of a reach for you, um, but you know, go ahead and try. And the reason I chose Lehigh is because they have an accelerated program with the University of Pennsylvania Dental School. And so all the colleges I applied to only had pre-dental programs because it was back in the fifth grade when I first got my, my Hawes palette expander. You know, I grew up in the retail business, Glenn, in the carpet business. And um, worked there since I could walk in my father's store. And uh, I learned a heck of a lot uh, from that experience, but I knew early on I did not want to be in the retail industry, in the retail business. And when I started going to my orthodontist, I'm like, you know, this is kind of cool. Uh, and it was in the fifth grade when I wanted, I made a decision that I was going to be an orthodontist. So I got into Lehigh and uh, went on uh, to do uh wanted to do some summer research at the University of Pennsylvania Dental School. And so I uh, called up because at the end of the day, Glenn, when the power of no is not just a motivator, but I'm trying to instill this to my kids that, you know, you do not get in life what you don't ask for. And the worst that can happen is somebody says no to you again or that you fail. And so during my last summer I would, uh, of college, I uh, called up University of Pennsylvania Dentist School. I, I didn't know who to even speak to. I said, you know, and again, Glenn, this is before the days of the internet, right? So this is like, you know, call up uh, information. You spend oh, like $1.25 to 411. get- 411. Yeah, 411 to, to get, you know, whatever number it is. And you just start calling and transferring and uh, finally got the, the head of the program for Lehigh, you know, for Penn. And I said, hey, I want to come do research. And sure enough, I, I got research. I got paid $1,200 for, I think, eight or 10 weeks of research. It was like, you know, when you're a college student, that's, that's like huge, huge money, huge money. And what year, what year are we talking? We are talking, I graduated in college. I graduated in 1994, but I left in 1993. So we're talking the summer of 92. Wow. And what happened is my, after my first year of dental school, my credits for my first year transferred back to college to satisfy my bachelor's degree. Cool. So I kind of, you know, saved a year of tuition for my parents and the whole thing. But when I'm at uh, doing this research, I said, you know, why can't I get credit for this? And so I called up the, the head of the biochemistry or biology department at Lehigh. And he's like, well, we usually don't do this. And I said, well, I'm going to write you a paper and we're going to sit down. So uh, at the beginning of September or when I got back to college, I sat down with the head of the department. I gave him my presentation. Mind you, I had never written a research paper before in my life, you know, but I went to the Penn Dental Library in between assays of what did I, I, I was 
reviewing, I was researching uh, AA and juvenile periodontitis. What is it? Uh, acetocommittance or actinobacillus? Actinobacillus, actinobacillus, myconitans. There you go. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> God bless you. So, Dr. Joseph Zambon, be proud of me 30 years later. <laughs> so, you know, and, and I, the guy gave me three college credits as if I took a course. So I lightened my load for uh, the, the last year. And so I went to, to Penn for dental school. Loved it, you know, as much as you can love dental school, I should say, uh, but did research uh, with my mentor then, Dr. Joseph Gaffari, uh, who uh, I spent countless hours um, in a basement with no windows counting models uh, for his class two study that he was part of with uh, Chapel Hill and University of Florida nice. uh, with the, the prospective studies. And I got into Temple um, when my mentor, Dr. Orhan Tunjai, um, and when I got to Temple, I told him, you know, um, we we're, were talking one day about um, relapse in orthodontics, and you talked about when you when you put, move a tooth, you know the, the circumferential fibers stretch and they get stressed. And we were talking about the classic studies of Edwards from the 1950s with the amalgam tattoos and circumferential fiberotomies to release uh, these circumferential fibers so that you get less relapse, etc. And I remember thinking, and you know. What is the opposite of stress? You kept using the word stress, and, and, and the opposite is to relax. And so I know it's hard to imagine, Glenn, but I was considered quite the jokester of my class in, in residency. And I said, well, Dr. Tunjai, what happens when we treat pregnant women? And it was like silence. And like people were waiting for me to like drop this, you know, th this, uh, uh, you know, joking line or, or what have you. And I said, no, I'm being serious. What happens when we treat pregnant women? He's like, what are you referring to? I said, well, pregnant women make this hormone called right. relaxin. Yep. That is, you know, best characterized for its role in uh, softening the pubic symphysis so that the pelvic girdle can widen and the baby come come through. Well, the, the pelvic symphysis is connective tissue. What's connective tissue? It's collagen and elastin. Well, what do we have in the periodontal ligament? What do we have in the gums? It's it's collagen and elastin. And so I did a a quick you know, research or in, in the library about different collagen types. And sure enough, the collagen types one and three and nine and 12, I forget all the details um, that are in the pubic symphysis are in the gingival tissue and the periodontal ligament. And so I said, hey, I want to do my research on relaxin as it might relate to developing a therapeutic adjunct in orthodontics. Wow. And he kind of looked at me, he's like, you know, have at it. Nobody's uh -huh. ever written. No, no, you know, uh, two and a half year orthodontic student has ever done basic science research like this. And he's like, well, I don't even know where, where to get the relaxin. We'd sound like we have it. And I said, well, let me figure that out. So sure enough, I just um, looked at all these old relaxin studies from elsewhere in, in the medical literature. And there's this uh, Dr. David Sherwood from the University of Illinois that I didn't know from Adam. And again, you know, I think Netscape was out at that point, <laughs> the first browser. So I like Google, you know, not Google, I searched, you know. I remember Netscape, Netscape, used come, Netscape used to come, Netscape used to come on a DV, on a CD <laughs> with AOL, remember? That's exactly right. Yeah. They used to come in the mail, like every week they'd send you another CD of Netscape, update, you know, to update, update, right. to update in the mail every week with another version of AOL. And you it's would, so you know, you would uh, uh, dial on. It would take 45 seconds to load and all, <laughs> all that stuff. And so, uh, again, call up David Sherwood, early University of Illinois, uh, Urbane, Champana, what a uh, campus. Introduced myself, said, hey, I I'm an orthodontic resident interested in relaxing and orthodontics. Can you send me some purified, you know, reconstituted, uh, or, or, or a powdered sample that I can reconstitute later. And he's like, sure, why not? <laughs> you wow. Know? And, and so, you know, FDA you know, be damned. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and so well, meanwhile, it wasn't, um, it, this was porcine. So it was pig relaxant. Right. So it was not, not human relaxant. And, and so, you know, fast forward, you know, a couple months later, I'm at uh, back at University of Pennsylvania. My, my mentor, Dr. Hunduk Na, who, um, is an orthodontist, does a lot of work with craniofacial disorders at University of Pennsylvania. She was my research um, uh, mentor and, and worked with me for my master's thesis. And sure enough, we you know, showed basic science that the presence of relaxin in the calvaria sutures of mice, which never been seen before, 
I demonstrated how simply adding relaxin to the periodontal ligament in uh, of the mouse uh, disrupted the, um, uh, the periodontal ligament fibers that typically were well, Sharpie's fibers that insert into the cementum and, and the bone and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and the PDL is highly organized typically, but with the addition of relaxin, it became very disruptive, very aorganized or not organized. And then we showed an increase in protease or enzyme activity. And so I went about my way, I published my research um, in a, a journal. And I'm thinking, you know, should I patent this? Should I not? Well, if you patent it while you're at school, the university owns the lion's share of the patent, right? And, right. and so then I, you know, went ahead and put it out in the public domain about a year and a half into private practice. Now we're talking, I, I graduated fall of 99 and started in um, uh, 2000, uh, about a year and a half later, I get this email from this gentleman that I've never met before. He's like, hey, I, I'm a, um, uh, Peter so-and-so, and I'm interested in your work in relaxing. Um, have you ever thought about taking it to the next level? And, and I look around the room and I'm like, you know, is my friend Joe or Kevin from residency trying to yank my chain here? So I, I like, you know, I uh, emailed the guy back. I'm like, sure, I can talk tomorrow. And lo and behold, he flew out from California and we sat down um, in uh, uh, Philadelphia area and um, just put this scheme together. It's like, well, I'd like to uh, have you out uh, to Sand Hill Road. We'd like to help raise some venture capital and take this to the next level. Wow. And so here I am, Glenn, I'm 29 years old. And I they fly me out to Kleiner Perkins. Kleiner Perkins, mind you, are one of the first one of the two firms that started Invisalign, along with Domain, who's based in Princeton. Kleiner Perkins are the people that started AOL, started Netscape, started Google. Uh, and, um, I, I am flown out there. I'm 29 years old. It's four of us against a panel of 15. Wow. And I have never sweated so much in my life. Uh, and, and here I am, this kid, this orthodontic alleged expert, uh, just pitching this idea. And I learned very quickly, Glenn, that the best thing you can do when you don't know an answer is simply say so. And you're at no fault for saying, hey, I don't have that exact answer, but here's what I do know. And here's how, with my knowledge of, of, of orthodontic tooth movement, we might be able to apply it to this technology. Again, the purpose of relaxing, I, I, my, my um, thought was to help develop an adjunct to help mitigate relapse. So instead of doing a circumferential fibrotomy, uh, you create this gel, this injection, this patch that you put onto um, the gums that would help reorganize the gingival fibers wow. so that they'd be less likely to, uh, to, to relapse. Um, and so uh, relaxin has a molecular weight of over 6,000 uh, kilodaltons. Again, I forget all these details. And what do we know about the interdental cull? What do we know about uh, the gingival sulcus? It is non-keratinized. And so they easily are very porous. And once it, 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 it goes into the sulcus, it goes right down to the periodontal ligament, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we hatched this idea. We were out there. They, I was there for like eight hours, moving from conference room to conference room, attorney to this or that, pitching the idea. Lo and behold, we raised six and a half million dollars the first round. To, oh, my gosh. To go proof of concept in animals. And a year and a half later, we went back for round two, another 16 and a half million. This time, Johnson & Johnson Development Co Corporation got involved. And we had a um, big trial in dogs to, again, prove the concept. Got these beautiful, um, beautiful histological slides. You know, I've been down to the FDA uh, once to, to, to help uh, design these trials, et cetera. And lo and behold, the, the company that I helped start, you know, the FDA is a very fickle thing. And they looked at orthodontics when we went into this, you know, the, 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 round, the first round of human clinical trials, which was done at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm sorry, University of Florida. I, I, I corrected myself. University of Florida uh, were neither black or white. They're very uh, gray, very, uh, the, the results are very uh, vague because nothing's ever been done like that before. I mean, when has we developed a therapeutic to inject, to apply to the gums, to help mitigate relapse or even potentially accelerate tooth movement? 
Yeah. Because uh, gingival fibers, the, the tension buildup is and can be a rate limiting factor when it comes to orthodontic tooth movement. So the FDA came back and said, you know, why, um, why would we want to develop a therapeutic adjunct in a primarily adolescent population when there's already a proven entity of retainers? Uh, number one. Number two, um, uh, orthodontics is not life and death. So why would we develop a therapeutic? And so it's a very narrow you know, mindset, if you will. And it's kind of a double-edged sword because that, that narrow mindset, Glenn, stifles innovation. And if you think about it, you know, the FDA looks at orthodontics as non-life threatening, uh, at primary adolescent. So they don't necessarily want to develop a therapeutic, an injectable to help augment uh, tooth movement, what I call the fourth order of orthodontics, being able to augment the, the, the uh, biology preceding orthodontic force application. Uh, but at the same time, it's good because then we won't be regulated as much by the government. You know, when you think about development of, of therapeutics and, and et cetera, it's, um, you know, it, it's a double edged sword. So 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 the power of no of saying, you know, I, I can't nobody's ever done research like this as a resident. Nobody's ever done this in orthodontics. It just is a motivating factor. Uh, and, and when I was up at the Angle Society uh, up for uh, membership, I, I was giving this story, uh, what I just told you. I showed this dog research that we are having done in Colorado by a third party. And, you know, I, I was basically accused at my angle society of plagiarism. Wow. That I was presenting other people's research. And I'm, I don't, I'm what, 31 at this point. Uh, uh, I don't even remember. And I remember, I'm like, how should I react to this? Should I, you know, open up? a can of whoop ass and, and, and be disrespectful and, 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 and fight back? Or, or should I take the higher road, which I did? And uh, I, I said, well, I can understand your concern. Meanwhile, I, I'm sweating again, like I was uh, on Sand Hill Road pitching, you know, for venture capital money. So I can understand your concern, but we have serious investors here. And if I were the one doing the research or anybody else on our team doing the research, then the FDA would be concerned that we uh, were tainting the results, that we were trying to doctor the results to get the results that we want. And so that's why we hired and spent the, 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 you know, several, a lot of the money that we helped raise and farm this out to a third party uh, institution to carry on this research. And that was like the best answer I could muster up in like three and a half seconds. Wow. Um, and, and so that, you know, so so the power of no, Glenn, when it comes to being a, an orthopreneur is is a, a true motivator. And again, it's not about proving people wrong. It's not about saying, I told you so I could do it anyway. It's about, you know, uh, listening to yourself. And and when you're told no to to kind of pivot and figure out a way uh, to get it done. Um, I hear you. You know, so I, I don't know if you had similar experiences in, in your uh, work career. Um, but you know, for me, uh, the power of no is, is something that, uh, I only have really begun the last couple of years to truly appreciate and try to integrate, uh, into my, my, my daily activities. I, um, I, I think you probably know, but I, uh, I got rejected, uh, if such a word would be appropriate to over 50 ortho programs the first time I applied. Wow. Um, yeah, I've mentioned it numerous times on the podcast, but again, if I just said, sure, no problem, it's okay. Uh, I'll just remain a successful GP and that'll be that. Um, you know, you and I wouldn't be, I would never have even known who you are, right? right. We never would have met, wouldn't have talked. And so um, I'm many things in life, but one thing I'm not is somebody who gives up easily. And, right. but only if, you know, if I try something and I realize that it's, it's, it's not meant to be, there's a time at which you just say, hey, you know, the old adage, peeing into the wind, um, you know, <laughs> right. but, but I, I honestly, my heart of hearts felt that A, I, I would be a decent orthodontist. B, it's something I really wanted for the right reasons, I, I would like to think. And C, I felt it was attainable. You know, I, I got in a couple of interviews and the, the weird part was each interview started with, 
you know, at your age, right, it was like already before I even sat down, I was already being sort of chastised for being a 44 year old applicant. <laughs> right. And so, you know, I, uh, the surest way to get me fired up is to say no to me, kind of like you said. And right. I think that's very common in ortho. I think I think we tend to be drivers and, you know, I think we don't like to be pushed down and told we can't do something because to be quite honest, some of the smartest, most accomplished people I've ever met in my life are my peers. And, you know, if, if you're, say, at AAO and you're in an elevator, going up a couple of stories and you got 30 seconds and asked everybody in that elevator, tell me the best accomplishment you've got, like that you've done. Right. Oh, I'm an Eagle Scout. Oh, I'm a black belt. Oh, I play three instruments. I speak six languages. Oh, I, you know, I do this. It, it, I've never been around a group of people who are as accomplished and smart. Um, and so I think the word no is a hard one for most orthodontists to really accept. And yeah, I agree true. with you a hundred, I agree with you a hundred percent. But uh, Go ahead. No, please, please. No, I mean, going back to, you know, the advent of, of aligner therapy. Um, you know, I remember back in the day we were people saying, Oh, can't do this. It can't do that. Can't move roots. And, and it just never made sense to me. You know, uh, teeth are not smart. Teeth are stupid. And they don't know where <laughs> the force comes from. Uh, they, they don't know the bracket that's on them. That, that was my favorite one. That's, that's the, very the true. The tooth doesn't know what bracket it has on it. That's very true. And so, uh, I, I just took it upon myself to figure out a lot of these things and, you know, at the end of the day, as my father always told me, Christopher Columbus took a chance once upon a time and, and look what happened to him. Yeah. Uh, and, and so if you can plot out, you know, what uh, a certain treatment plan and, and uh, tooth movement and try to figure it out. I mean, look, Glenn, I, I don't my, my stuff stinks as, as much as the next person. I'm by no means perfect. And where I think I made my splash in, in speaking is that I went up there and I showed, I showed it all, you know, the good, bad, and the really ugly. And, yeah. and, and that's how I learned. And, and, you know, this is no disrespect to other speakers that I, I heard early on in my career, but a lot of it was just, everything was perfect. And that's not the way it works in my, you know, offices in, in Central I agree. New Jersey. Um, and so I routinely w would show uh, my, uh, my, my highs and my lows and everything uh, in between. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to this, you know, alleged KOL, you know, oh, please. I, 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 you know, well, you know, I've, I've heard what you said before about, well, we could make, you know, all the time we spend on, uh, the presentations that we do the time away from the office, we could make more money. I get all that. And I'm not uh, agreeing or disagreeing with you, although I agree with you. Uh, but I, I, I'm here to say that, you know, when it comes to me, for me, it's not it's not just about that. You know, I, I go on these Facebook groups. I simply try to offer uh, a different perspective. Uh, and sometimes it's readily accepted. And other times I think I'm uh, unfairly tarred and feathered, uh, you know, for, for no reason. And the funny thing is, Glenn, you know, at, at a line uh, in, the, in this past fall, we have uh, reviews uh, every year, and uh, I think I probably had the lowest scores of any speaker at a line. Uh, and I'm being 100% truthful. I was below average because when I speak for them at an event, I'm not always towing the company message. I'm not always towing the company line, and I'm up there talking about you know my experiences, what I use, and what works well, and what does not work well. So my my point is, as a, an alleged KOL. Uh, on one hand, I'm being, you know, uh, somewhat tarred and feathered from time to time by my peers because they think all I'm doing is promoting Invisalign. I'm, I'm being paid to, you know, either promote it or I'm up here advertising the fellowship course or what have you. And on the other side, from the company itself, I'm getting a low score because people in the room listening to me don't <laughs> like what I'm saying. So either way, you know, I, I'm not making people happy. No, uh, and, and that's okay. I mean, sure. the surest way to fail is to try to please everybody. Sure. And, and you're not that guy. So, you know, I know who you are. And I think anybody who knows you knows who you are. And at, at the end of the day, the whole key opinion leader thing is kind of a joke to me. You know, everybody who I've gotten on here from John Graham to Stu Frost, yourself, I mean, I've had some great people on here who make a decent living speaking for other companies. But, you know, I think the reason folks get up on stage, and I've done it for many years, A, 
I love teaching, but I don't like doing it where I'm told how, what, and when to teach. Right. Um, number two, I was told by Bill Robbins, who's, in my opinion, one of the most knowledgeable and best teachers in the restorative world. I've, I've, said, I've heard him several times in Princeton. It's oh, like, he's amazing. Yeah, he's fantastic. His, his global facial diagnoses right. is something that every orthodontist should be taught. Uh, it was dogma when I was doing restorative and cosmetic. But, you know, he told me, he's like, Glenn, you know why I do this? Because I love entertaining. And right. I, I'm not going to join a drama cr- club or drama group because my entertaining happens on stage. And I love to do it with slides and putting together presentations. And then there's the other reason why I love doing it. It's be- and I told it to somebody today in the office. It's that I am not, first of all, the most knowledgeable person in the room by far, right? right. You, need to, you need to be arguably the most knowledgeable person in the room on that subject, <laughs> right? But right. you don't have to be the finest doctor on the planet. You just have to have an insight that you can share with others that hopefully they find you know, useful when they do that. But when I have cases that are going to go on the big screen and I see them magnified, oh, it man. makes me such a much better orthodontist. Without a doubt. It is, you know, you show your before and the case looked really good when you debonded. Right. And then, then you throw it up on a <laughs> 16 by nine screen and go, Ugh, you know, oh, yeah. it, it looked really good, but look at the tip on that tooth. Look at the rotation, tiny two degrees. And all of a sudden you go back to your office the next day and right. you dial in. And so I've always been an advocate of saying, whether it's for a company or a local study club or just for GPs, every orthodontist, every clinician should be throwing their slides up on a screen periodically right. and being held accountable to themselves, not to anybody else. Because for me, when I started taking good photos, I got better. When right. I started showing my photos, I became way better. And It's totally true. There, there's no better way to keep yourself honest than be in front of a firing squad of your peers. Yep. A- and um, I, I, I totally uh, agree with you with that. And to, to your, your story about Bill Robbins, you know, I, I took a lot of acting courses in college. That was like my outlet from sitting in chemistry lab for four hours or what have you. <laughs> and, and so being up there, it, it was, you know, when I speak and lecture, it, it is, I, 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 I'm not going to say I'm addicted to it, but when I'm away from teaching for three months, I, I feel like a crack addict and I start want, you know, uh, scratching my forearms <laughs> trying to get back at it because it, 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 it's the, get me a crowd. I need a crowd right now. Exactly. No, but it, it's the teaching. It's the camaraderie. And, and it is, you know, truly, Glenn, uh, I, I do it because it's a part of my career, an aspect of my career that I truly did not envision almost 20 years ago. I used to watch people. Uh, in the audience as a as a resident, as a new graduate. And I would just really soak up what I liked, what I didn't like about them, whether they could tell good stories, whether they could engage the uh, the, the the audience and, and to relay their message exactly. effectively. And, and that's what I try to do. And when people come up to me and they tell me uh, at, at a meeting or, or that, you know, uh, you, you, I've been following you for years. I, I love your information. You have truly changed the way I do things. My practice, you've made my life easier. I've had spouses come up to me and say, you have saved our marriage because wow. my spouse is so much happier, male and female it goes both ways. You yeah. know, my, my spouse is happier coming home from work with, with doing more aligners than, than braces, yeah. uh, whether, whether it's a meeting, whether it's the fellowship course that I do with Moz, you know, that to, to me and, and to Moz for that matter, that is really where we get, um, I, I do like an internal fist pump, you know, cause for me, yeah. that, that's what it means to, to me. So and a, a while back I'd written on my blog. Um, and I posted on a Sunday about the fact that aligners are not going away. Right. Uh, they're here to stay. I can't imagine us going backwards. Um, I'm not saying it's going to take over the world anytime soon, but I certainly think the market share is certainly increasing. Sure. I don't, I don't ever talk anybody into aligners in my office inappropriately. If someone comes in and says, I'm open to braces or Invisalign, I give them the pros and cons of both. Sure. But I'd, I'd written a blog post about the fact that, you know, they're not going away and you really should throw yourself into education and time to become as good at aligners as you're trying to be with wires and brackets. And 
I didn't think it was really that much of a bizarre message. You know, if you're going to be offering something in your practice, you'd better become as good at it as you possibly can because right. the patient deserves that. And I was, I was lambasted and attacked by the same voices that do it over and over again online. And, and I was suddenly being challenged. Show us your cases. You've only been orthodontist for four years. You know, what are you doing? And I said, no, I'm not showing you my cases. And privately, I did send cases right. to a couple of the people who were really sort of yelling at me. And, and I didn't hear any more after I did that. But, you know, <laughs> it, it caused me to go back. And, and by the way, as an aside, I will never show cases to people who I don't trust, sure. right? Because once you give your information out, you do not know what they're going to do with it. You don't know what they're going to say. And, you know, it's just it's an unsafe environment. And I don't mind sharing cases publicly, but not if you say to me, well, I want to see your cases. Well, sorry, that's not going to happen. But if you and I sat down, I'll gladly open my computer and say, Jonathan, take a look at these cases. What do you think? Tell me how I can get better. Um, but it's really interesting because that whole episode caused me to go do something. And it's something I need to do more often. And Vince Kokich, the late, great, mm -hmm. amazing Vince Kokich, who was a, a big influence a, in my life. A great storyteller, by the way, when he oh. lectured. Fantastic. And, right. and he and his daughter, who has a master's in education, uh, gave a great lecture once on how to lecture. And it was really, right. really good. Yes. But, but I sat with him before I left Seattle. And I right. said, you know, Vince, I'm going back to ortho. Um, what advice would you give me? And he gave me some great advice. But one of the things he said to me was that twice a year, I think he said, he just goes to his front and asks for the names of the last 10 cases that were debonded. Right. And he pulls the records and scrutinizes them and then measures them based on a board scoring system. And, you know, I, after that whole event with my blog post, I went back on and I picked my last 10 aligner cases, <laughs> you know, and you go right. back to them and you learn. And, you know, whether I'm going to show them publicly or not as a material, it's the fact that, you know, we need that feedback. And the old saying is never trust a skinny chef because <laughs> a, a fat chef is always tasting their food. <laughs> and, and getting feedback. Right, right, right. And, like and we need to be doing that more often. I, I need to be. I'm not going to say it for anybody but myself, but I need to do that more often. I need to be looking at my finishes, you know, consecutives, not say, hey, check out these cool cases I did. No, no, it's totally, it's totally true. I, um, going back and, and sh reviewing these, knowing that you're going to be putting up on a big screen, uh, consecutive cases, uh, it, it is very important and it, it is, uh, self, um, what's the word? Self measurement. Uh, yeah, that, that is truly uh, the the best learning of all. You know, it's a it's a nightstick yeah. and a yardstick. Sorry, but so I want to switch gears for just a second. Sure. Um, one so three years ago, three years. Ago, so I, what most people don't know is that as a GP, I started with Invisalign in two thousand and three. Right. Um, back in the days where I was really excited when I learned that they were coming out with a square edge detachment. <laughs> you, you remember those days when sure. it was all rounded saucer shaped attachments. So, you know, people are screaming at me, oh, you've only been doing this four years. No, I started with Invisalign 2003. But unlike most GPs, I was doing it to set up my restorative cases because I could control it, or at least I thought. Right. And I, and, you know, the measure of realizing that after about four to five dozen cases, um, I wasn't getting the results I wanted. And right. I didn't, I realized I didn't know enough to be doing this, which is kind of unusual in the GP world. But I, I reached out to my amazing orthodontist at the time, uh, Dr. Paolo Leone and mm -hmm. Greg Vaughn, I'm giving you a shout out right now. <laughs> and I, I said to them, mea culpa, I shouldn't have been doing this. Any cases that I'm in the process, I'll turn over to you and we'll figure out the finances. And I'm not touching this again. Right. And then, you know, even in ortho residency, I, I played with it a little bit and, you know, there were some great people at my program at Nova who did a lot of um, just amazing Invisalign. Right. Um, and I sit and we talk and I just didn't get into it. And then about three years ago, I started doing more of it. And then the Aligner Intensive Fellowship started. Right. And I said, you know, let me go try this out. And all of a sudden, between you and Maz, I started getting all these tips and these tricks and understanding, hey, just treat it like ortho. This right. is not, don't treat it like plastic, treat it like ortho understand moments and couples and, and anchorage and treat it the exact same way and just follow a few basic rules and it, and it works like braces. And in a broader sense, I think that's exactly what happens. And, and I have you to thank for it. And, and I'm going to say this unsolicited by you because right. I am not a KOL for Jonathan Nicosesis, <laughs> but anybody out there who has not taken the aligner intensive fellowship 
taught by uh, these two guys, by Jonathan and Maz, please go take it. Um, it is like drinking I, from a fire hose. Well, the, you guys did a remarkable job with the amount. I could not keep up with all the information. Well, uh, it, I mean, really, it was amazing. And, you know, there are some out there who will say, you know, you can't scale it the way you're doing, and I disagree. But I will say that you've changed the way I finish my cases, and I can look people in the eye and say, you know what, I can finish a case the same way with the liners, in some cases easier and better than I can with wires. Sure. When, I'm, when I'm sitting there bending 500 different wires and putting all these bends in three dimensions versus an aligner where I can really control it much more easily and move teeth, all teeth at the beginning. Right. Um, so thank you. Well, well, thank you, Glenn. I appreciate those kind words. You know, Maz and I truly, uh, this is like our labor of love uh, back to the profession. And, you know, the, 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 the quick and dirty story behind uh, the, the fellowship is, Many years ago, I was on the couch, uh, self-medicating myself with a, gla <laughs> a glass of wine and having just put three young kids to bed. And I was texting Maz and I said, you know, we should do something on our own. And, you know, think of think of a, a course, like a two day course uh, <laughs> and and put it together. And so we, we started hammering these ideas back and forth. And uh, we was it? I think the summer of 2015, I flew down to St. Louis. My family was uh, in Europe, uh, in Greece for a few weeks without me, uh, which is really a vacation for myself to be home without three kids. You know, that, that, that's incredible. Uh, and we flew, I flew down there and we hammered out 12 chapters of a, a textbook and this curriculum for this two day course. And uh, we um, contacted uh, a line and after several months of back and forth, they politely told us no, the great motivator. I heard the word <laughs> no. And uh, we were certainly a bit um, uh, down. We were deflated. We were like, uh, dare I say, defeated. Like, you know, we don't know how to write a book. Uh, we, we don't know, you know, how to put on a, a two day course, all the logistics and uh, et cetera. And so we kind of walked away and, you know, I owe Maz and, and his wife for coming up with the the idea to to put it all online, and uh, you know the power of no once again uh, reared its ugly head, and at the end of the day, it was an opportunity to to break what we thought wasn't broken and make it better, and and here we are now, and now we are offering forty five hours of CE ADA CERP uh, credit hours. Um, uh, for a course that, you know, is over four months long. Uh, we have, we have orthodontists around the globe that are signing up for this. And that is impactful. And, and I'd like to emphasize that we keep it for orthodontists only. Um, well, let me rephrase that because now with ADA, we, we have to nimbly um, say that you must have as a prerequisite uh, two full years of orthodontic uh, specialty training uh, and experience. So, um, it is, uh, it, it is something that we never envisioned and, uh, we, we get so much out of it, uh, more so than what we put into it, you know, all the hours. Uh, and it's not just us, it's all of our fantastic, um, guest lecturers that we have. I think we're up to 12 at this point, maybe 13. Um, and, uh, there's more to come in the future. That's awesome. Uh, so we're, we're brainstorming about uh, some other uh, unmet opportunities. That's great. Uh, that were based on feedback that, that we've gotten, so. And so um, I'm going out to visit Maz in May. You know, right. I, I, my way of growing is just visiting other practices. And every month I try to go to one. I'm, I'm heading off to Chris Feldman this upcoming Sunday night. Beautiful. So that should be fun. And uh, going to see Maz in May, just to go learn and watch and observe. And at some point I'm gonna come out to Princeton and if you weren't in the middle of nowhere, uh, <laughs> well, maybe I'll take you to an Eagles game. <laughs> you know, I have, if, if, if my body is lifeless and dead and the blood has been drained from me, feel free to drag me into the stadium and I'll be better behaved than the rest of the fans there. That's all I'm going to say. Um, but let's ask you the, the tough question here. Yes. Um, what case walks in mm. uh, that you see and you say, geez, uh, this is not one where I want to do plastic? Oh, great question. Um, off the bat, um, uh, it, it is the, uh, adult with three impacted cuspids. 
<laughs> uh, that I say, hey, I'll give it a whirl. If you're if you're willing, I'm willing. Uh, but here's what's going to be involved. And truth be told, you know, I'm at 85 percent aligners in my practice. I personally think that the easier, more straightforward approach would be traditional braces. You know, and, yeah, I agree. And, and I'm very upfront with that. Um, but 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 question for you. Right. I'm going to give you a statement. Yes. Since, and by the way, that patient with three impacted cuspids, yeah. they happen to be a super low angle class two. <laughs> Just want to throw that in there. Right. Because right. that's a really good case to treat with plastic, too. Right. Well, listen, if it's an adult uh, low angle class two or three impacted cuspids, I got to tell you, Glenn, on the pecking order of importance, the class two is kind of down at the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. worried about bringing those cuspids in. I worry about the class two yeah. after 38 months of pulling on those things. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> um, so, but I'm going to ask you the other question. Um, can you treat any case with plastic if given enough time? And I don't mean it in the sense of, well, here's eight years, but and, and you're allowed to use auxiliary appliances like a TPA with a with an arm off of it to help sure. your cuspid in. Is if someone says I will not do braces, can you give a more than satisfactory result on any case given enough time uh, with plastic? Uh, yes, of course. There's always going to be exceptions. There's always going to be the the one case type, and you know I, I will tell you this. You know, let's say if I had um, missing fives. And they wanted to bring the sixes forward through the E space. That's a case I, I, I'm really going to not want to treat with aligners. I mean, trying to, to mesialize molars, uh, eight, nine millimeters in the mandibular arch with aligners, that's a tall order, you know, and I think you have to use auxiliaries for, for that thing, uh, for that, that type of case. Um, but, you know, I, it, it, looking back at my history, Glenn, it was those patients, the parents, the, 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 the adults that said, I don't want braces. Figure this out. You know, the, the phase one anterior open bite uh, nutrition issues, uh, tongue thrust sensory issues where I wanted to put a hyrax with tongue prongs in. Mom looked at me and said, there's no way in hell you're putting that barbaric trap in, in my daughter's mouth. We're doing this with Invisalign. And I'm like, I'll try it. I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this is like six years ago. I'm like, you know, an eight year old, you know, and, and but lo and behold, it closed down the anterior open bite and uh, it, it's it's been stable and it just it was a big wow for me. So, you know, uh, listen to your patients that give you resistance that the, the patients that you told no, you know, right? You told no at yeah, first exactly. and, and they are, you know, motivated. Uh, than ever. As my father always uh, tells me, the, the best way to uh, sell somebody something is to tell them yeah. they can't have it. You mean the and, magic word of no, Jonathan? Yeah, the magic word of no. And 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 when people come into my office for a second or third opinion and said uh, the Invisalign is not for them, they can't have it, they're already sold. Yeah. And, and, and I'm like, hey, I could do it either way. It makes no difference to me. And so getting back to your question, um, what case... I, I think that very deep, low angle uh, case, you know, I'm going to have to try to open up the bite, run some vertical elastics. But we, we know from our orthodontic literature that, you know, the curve of speed gets pounded back in or open up a bite on a low mandibular plane angle will relapse in, in retention. And it's just, yeah. especially if they're not growing. So uh, the, the cases I would not do are very few and far between. And when it comes to being outside of my comfort zone, I'm very upfront with people. I say, here are the challenges we're going to um, encounter. Here's how we might circumvent those challenges with this auxiliary or that auxiliary. If you're up for it, I'm up for it too. Nice. So uh, going off topic here a little bit. Right. For, because, I mean, again, uh, at this point in the game, how many cases would you say you've done in plastic? Uh, I am about 2,300. So you've done a couple. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nice. So AP correction. Mm. All right. What's your go to for uh, AP correction in those, you know, 13, 14 year old kids? Are you a sequential distillation kind of guy? No, hate it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so, just, that's why I'm asking. Right. Right. So I, uh, I know the answer. You know, you and I have spoken enough times and I've seen you speak. Enough I know 
a lot of the answers to your questions, but I'm dying to hear the most, you know, there was, uh, sorry for digressing. I do this no, all the time. Of course. Welcome to ADHD on parade. <laughs> hey, look, Jonathan, a squirrel, a squirrel, um, a squirrel over there. Um, what was I saying? Right. So rich, um, AP what's correction. His name? No, no, I'm talking about, uh, Dawson, you okay. know, from the Panky right. Institute. He used to say, I don't care if you quote me just, but always date me. So that you could say that he said X at this time, mm. but a year later he said, quote me whenever you want, but always add a date. Right. Understood. Because you have the right to change based on experience. Sure. And so, you know, what I've heard you say a year ago may not be what you're going to say today. Right. So right. I, I sort of say tongue in cheek because it's such a dynamic, quick moving field in terms of us understanding, you know, we do a hundred cases, look back and now change right. Do another hundred cases. So. Again, um, what's your go-to for AP correction nowadays in that 12, 13-year-old, normal divergent, you know, class two? Okay, so normal divergent. I mean, so, uh, look, ultimate depends, Glenn, what I put in my coffee that morning, right? You know, so uh, some days I will use a Mara if I think we need profile improvement, if I think we need um, uh, have a retrognathic mandible. Now, to your point, to your statement, you know, that's what I was using concomitantly with aligners for the past eight years, uh, Amara with aligners. And right. now with the I'm MA, waiting for I'm waiting for that. I was waiting for that's why I asked the right. question. So, so now with the MA, um, I uh, have about eight, you know, it was just approved. I was not part of the original study, so I don't have any finished cases. I have about eight running around in my practice now. Um, and they are being very well tolerated. That's all I can say. And, and look, at the end of the day, any sagittal correction, Glenn, there's no secret sauce to it. There, there, it's all about change. It's, it's grabbing and stealing and borrowing from everywhere. So yeah. is there AP correction sagittal? Sure. Is there vertical? Absolutely. That's the unsung hero and the alteration of the occlusal planes. So whether it's customized plastic, whether it's twin block with cold cure acrylic, whether it's a Frankel one, two or whatever it was that I helped Dr. Gafari look at, you know, back in dental school. It's all about relieving the acrylic, allowing, you know, uh, different teeth to erupt, to alter the occlusal planes. Um, and right now, to answer your question directly, Glenn, for a retrognathic mandible that needs some profile improvement, note I am very intentionally not saying I'm growing mandibles because we cannot grow mandibles. You we sure? Because yeah, I, yeah. I thought you could grow no. mandibles. No. no? And, and that whole I, I have some in my backyard. I planted them. And <laughs> <laughs> and that whole nonsense about the MA claiming they could grow mandibles. What a bunch of poppycock. Yeah. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, um, uh, any case that I used to do with Maras, I'm now doing with the MA. Any case that I think the profile is decent, I'm going to get some good growth anyway. I prefer the motion appliance because it's quick, it's beautiful, it's simple, and it's easy. Um, when it comes to distillation, sequential distillation, I limit it to about two millimeters or less, along with some molar rotation and class two elastics, and that looks good. And then the other thing with class two correction, Glenn, is the vertical dimension, that unsung hero. And so yeah. you've taken the course of, I have a high angle case. I'll be channeling my tip back bends and inner Charles Tweed, and I'll intrude yeah. the molars, uh, alter the occlusal plane, and and use a pull and hope strategy with elastics. And um, you're basically employing a MIAW strategy at correct. that point. That, that is correct. Where, so, where we're basically, we're going to pivot off the bicuspids and we're going to alter the occlusal plane. Yeah, it, it, it really it comes down to that. So, uh, you know, but the beautiful thing is, Glenn, you know, just last week, I had treatment plan, a class two div to a 12 year old uh, for uh, aligners and Amara. And after nine months or so of, of advancing the div two to get the overjet to do, you know, the Mara, I said, you know what, instead of that big metal contraption that we're going, that I showed you nine months ago, now I've got the ability to do it all in plastic. And I show them some examples. I have a, a model of it and they were like thrilled that they didn't have to have this, this metal in there. And, and people are like, oh, well, is it going to work? Well, if it's not, well, look, how many times when I take out a Mara after 9, 10, 11 months, do I need class 2 elastics to, to tidy things up? 
you know, probably the majority of the time, <laughs> you know, yeah. so, so if I have to use class two elastics after an advancement feature with, with plastic wings, so be it. It's not the, the, the worst thing in the world. No, uh, and you, but, yeah. I'll, I always say, um, Dr. Malcolm Meister, um, who's one of my favorite people also on the planet, um, former chairman of Nova, started the program. Wow. Um, and I once said he's forgotten more ortho than I'll ever learn. <laughs> he has this great article he wrote in the SAO News, just flew under the radar years ago. And when I sat with Luis Carrier once and I explained to him these things that I'd learned from Dr. Meister, he looked at me as like, where did you hear this? And I always thought it was Ricketts that he was quoting, but he actually came up with it himself. And every class two case has comp has only five components of, you know, a, the composite change from class two to class one. And it's it's derotation of the upper molars, it's mm -hmm. distalization of the upper molars, it's mesialization of the lower dentition, it's enhancing differential growth and postural change. Right. And you can't have anything else. That's it. Um, and it doesn't matter if you use plastic, uh, wires, brackets, what have you. And he sent me, and I, I wish I could find it, and if I ever do, I'll send it to you, this great article from like 56 or 58, where a guy took a whole bunch of cadavers. I think his name was like Schlereth. Okay. And he, he took like 100 or 200 cadavers, and he sectioned them through the TM joint. And he looked at their occlusion and where the disc position was. And he showed that just by getting the disc back on, you could get between two and four millimeters of class one correction. Hmm. Just by... Just by putting the disc back That's on the condylar head. Mm -hmm. And and there was a whole history behind why he did that paper. And Dr. Meister explained it to me. You know, and this is after I graduated, right? The best tidbits come when you're no longer a student in school, right? And you kind of understand it a little bit and ask different questions. And at the end of the day, whether it's elastics, Amara, an MA, if we can get that condyle to sort of get that 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 the disc captured properly, that alone is going to gain you some space. And that, sure. that's the postural change that Dr. Meister talks about. And so, I, again, it's kind of funny when I see somebody post a new class two appliance and people rip into it and say, oh, that doesn't work. Oh, that's garbage. Because everything has side effects. Right. And that's the name of the game is how do we mitigate the side effects? No, I, 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 to your point, I, 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 my chairman, Orhan Tunjai, said all class two correctors do this. And he held his hands out. And one forward uh, replicating over jet, the other behind replicating, you know, the mandible being back. And he just kind of slid and tilted his, his palms of his hands together. And he's like, all you're really doing is altering the occlusal plane and getting some growth. And yeah. and, and there it is. And, and the molar rotation, that that is just, you know, kind of the cherry on top of, of the Sunday, so to speak. Yeah. And the one thing. You know, and the message I always make about the motion, because people think it's just like wearing class two elastics, and, and I won't belabor the point too much, but the same things that work against us with using a lower um, plastic, whatever you want to call it, a liner, uh, uh, anything you want to do in-house or through Invisalign, you can't get very good tipping of those teeth easily on a lower with class two elastics. And that working against you works for you with the motion. Right. Because when, I, when I've superimposed, I see like, on average, between one and three millimeters of proclination change in class twos when I use a motion, whereas I'll see anywhere upwards of 10 to 12 millimeters when I superimpose. And that was my master's was Ceph superimposition. Right. So, you know, it's really interesting how each appliance has its side effects or lack thereof. And like you said, using the right one. But I am not a fan of sequential distillation, my friend. No. I've, seen, I've seen Scott Fry do some amazing things. Yeah with it. And I don't know what he sprinkles in, on his patient's <laughs> aligners, but he does things that I just look at and say, how are you doing this? And he just looks at me and says, I do it. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well. But again, it's like uh, you can pick up a tennis racket and uh, of a different size weight or golf club and one person can hit it. I've got one golf club in my quiver that is my go-to and I can just swing the hell out of it and it goes straight. It's my four rescue wedge. And it, I can hit it, hit it straight and accurate and place the ball where I want. I'll take my three wood out and it's a crap shoot, you know, where the ball is going. So I hear you, man. it just, everybody's got their thing, uh, their, their appliance, their modality, their, their way that they use that appliance, that modality, whether it's Invisalign, whether it's, you know, 3M plastic, whether it's, you know, door brackets with magic doors on them, whether it's whatever, but, um, you know, it all works. And, I hear you. Yeah. So, and like, and like I've heard a lot of people say, I don't talk anybody into Invisalign uh, ever. I give them all their choices, let them pick what they want. And 
you know, the last thing I want to touch on is that you've changed my practice because once I embraced the Invisalign about three years ago and really jumped into it a lot more, the plastic employee that you talk about, <laughs> uh, it's, it's sort of funny, but it's so true because my practice last year averaged over $500,000 per clinical assistant in terms of wow. production. Beautiful. Right. I did, I did, uh, working the numbers up, we did about 560 wow. uh, per clinical assistant because of the amount of plastic. Right. The, my share of chair is well above 60% now right. in terms of plastic in my practice. The parents are happier, the kids are happier, the adults are happier, and the patients come in for 10 minute appointments. Oh, and, you know? and, and less frequent. And, you know, as I've said before, your patients like you, but they don't want to see you. No, uh, they don't. And, and it took me uh, about five, six years ago is to really appreciate that. Yeah. And um, I, I had a mom today that uh, you know, yesterday, the, the kid didn't know what he wanted to do. Braces, this, I didn't really want to do anything. Typical 15 year old boy could make up his mind. Mom's like, listen, if we're doing this, we're doing it with with Invisalign because I don't want to have to come every six to eight weeks. I want to come every you know 12 to 16 weeks. And it, it was just eye opening to me to watch the marketplace in play in my new exam room where it's the mom, you know, busy with other kids with with a, a job that needs to balance it out. And for them, it's all about convenience. Agreed. And, it, you know, what's interesting about it is that, you know, the other side of the coin is um why would you pay? I'm not doing Invisalign so I can be part of some special club or that I can be called a diamond provider. That yeah. stuff doesn't mean anything to me. And I am paying a lot of money, right? If you, sure. do three, if you do 350 cases a year of Invisalign, you know, you're going to pay $400,000 in lab bill. Right. Um, there's no question about that. But if you're doing 350 cases of Invisalign a year, you've got a $2 million practice. Right. Um, and, you know, my feeling is, Let's take on assumption the argument that's always thrown against folks who do a lot of plastic, which is that, well, you can't get as good of a result. We've already sort of dismissed that. So we're moving past it. Right. Let's assume that you're striving for the same outcome with plastic that you strive for when you do, um, when you do brackets and wires and that you're not going to accept a half-baked outcome. So let's get right. past that. If that's the case, I will say that my stress levels – have gone down so much right. in my practice. My assistance stress levels have gone down so much right. in our practice. And the the most beautiful things I can do with plastic that I can't do with brackets and wires, for instance, um, I put somebody into aligners and at their first check, they are not brushing well. I tell them, you're going to nighttime only, buddy. You're staying on number 12. Right. You're going to brush your teeth perfectly right. until we're ready to go to number 13. You can't do that with braces and wires. Right. You just can't. No, you're you know, right. The ability to have a, an anterior crossbite on the upper two and it's starting to wear down and start somebody on the liners to just get the two at a crossbite and say, okay, and then we'll wait. We'll wait another four to six months for the rest of the teeth to come in and we'll rescan them at that point. It's, it's, and yeah, it's a beautiful. The ability to start and stop at your leisure to solve specific problems has been huge for me. It, it, and, it is. I mean, you can bend it, uh, pun intended, you can bend the plastic however you want to and use it uh, however you want to. It's truly a beautiful thing. I'm, I'm working on my AAO presentation for uh, the Align booth. And one of the, it is a, uh, the, uh, what is uh, looking, at, what, how is incorporating an Invisalign focused practice? What, what are the advantages? And my plastic employee talk in 2016, when I did 50 cases treated with aligners versus 50 with braces, the last 50 that I treated uh, aligners, I back then in 2016, I had seen them uh, finish them in 15 office visits, which I thought was great. Since that time, 15 office visits for aligners. Uh, correct. But this is back when it's right. it like, you know, for uh, <laughs> 2000, uh, you know, 14 to 2016. That's I'm just I, saying it's changed so much. Right. And since then, 2019, I am looking at reviewing cases now. I am my sweet spot now is uh, uh, seven to nine office visits and I'm nice. done. So if you start 400 cases a year. OK, and let's, let's just put some metrics to this. You start 400 patients a year and instead of uh, seeing uh, completing their treatment 
in in 12 i'm sorry it was 12 office visits 12 office visits and i'm now down to seven to nine i'm, I'm decreasing uh, three visits to five visits right so times 400 patients you're looking at roughly 2000 2000 less appointments oh it's more you, than that. that that you need to schedule in your schedule each year it's I mean, bigger than that because that you're calculating for one year. What about the the carryovers from the year before? Of course, yeah, of course. It, right. So right. it's even bigger than that. It, that but, that that is profound. Oh, it's it's massive. And and again, do I like paying the lab bill to another company? Absolutely not. No. But at the at the end of the day, um, again, the assumption is you're going to treat them just as well. You're not going to make any sacrifices. But our ability to scale right. is so different. I'm 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 hiring another assistant now. And my team has not even asked me to do that. I'm just like, I think we need to get somebody else because summer's coming and we've been growing. Right. And I, I just, I see the writing on the wall, but they're like, we don't need anybody. We're fine. I'm like, do you guys, like, should I tell you guys what you're producing per person here? Or should I just keep my mouth shut? And um, no, I, you don't I, I keep my mouth shut. Yeah, keep your mouth shut. Yeah. But, you know, it, you know, when it comes to, you know, going back to me teaching, a lot of the stuff I started out with was, you know, how do I get a better result? So it was the mechanics, it was the attachments, it was, you know, um, asking for certain things. And when clinical thresholds and, and conditions were not met, I thought outside the box and created my own stuff. And, and a natural evolution, you know, simply like reinventing myself, uh, I, I would then talk about seamless integration. Then from seamless integration, then it went into the economics and the plastic employee. And so you know, it, it's very easy for me to come up with new topics because all I'm doing is relating my own experience in, yeah. my, in, 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 in my offices in Princeton and West Windsor. Uh, and, and that has really just been a, a guiding light for me, uh, just simply saying it as it is, sharing these experiences. And um, and now uh, we're looking at the scalability after we've we've gone through this evolution from mechanics to office integration to economics to now scalability um, and it's really it. amazing. And, and I just wanna make one last point about that is I did the math and I will never ever come out ahead financially by doing aligners. I just won't because even though I am I have less employees, that cost never really makes up for my added lab bill, but the amount extra it costs me for aligners far outweighs the down, you know, the amount it costs more is outweighed by all the benefits that I see in my life. And I mean, do you say, of course, but to many people out there, you know, they say you're leaving an extra $250,000 on the table or $200,000 on the table versus having another two or three assistants. But if you want to sit there and tell me that having more assistants is the way you want to run your practice, that more people, more cooks in the, in the kitchen has been right. a good thing historically. Right. Um, I'm, I, if I can work with one person, you know, my whole life and never have a second person in the office other than that person, that'd be wonderful. It, but, it, it, totally true. Yeah. And at, so, the end, at the end of the day, technology does not replace us. Technology repurposes us. Technologies allows us the, the ability to, uh, um, to allocate the scarcity of our resources in a most efficient means. Yeah. And so what are our scarcity? It's, it's time, labor, uh, and schedule capacity. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it, it just it's a different shift. It's a different mindset. And it doesn't happen overnight, man. You, you have to commit to mastering uh, orthodontics yeah. with plastic, with whatever plastic you want to use. Uh, but getting back to your point, uh, it, it ain't retracting. It's only going to get bigger. Uh, and um, we we as orthodontists must know how to uh, to use it. Yeah. I agree. And and if you're an, a braces only doc, God bless you. Right. If that's what you want to do, just do braces only and do, you know, the limited Invisalign here and there. It's going to be a mix. But like I said, right. at least in my community where I practice near a major metropolitan center right. where Smile Direct clubs and Invisalign stores and people seeing plastic everywhere, people come into my office every single day asking they want plastic. And many of them uh, and this is a conversation for another time because we'll go too long in it. <laughs> say, I've been to two other orthodontists who say I'm not a candidate. Right. Happened and I look at them, I go, okay. Uh, everybody has their strengths and weaknesses and things that they feel they can and can't do. And I respect that they didn't want to treat you this way, but I think we can. Right. And right. it's really interesting. So that said, I'm going to move us on to the last part. And well, you wait, listen before, to the... before uh -oh. we get there, 
I, I, I've been chomping at the bit to ask you this and, and to kind of throw a curveball at you, Glenn. Anytime. You know, when I'm traveling or if I'm on vacation, which rarely happens, or if I'm just sitting, I often think, what are the top five albums that I would want with me <laughs> if I were like, you know, on a desert island in jail or, you know, in a place where I would never have any other, you know, ability to have any other music or or what have you. What are your top five albums, Glenn? Oh, my. Um <laughs> You know, um, I like the fact that you're uh, you're turning the tables on the interviewer. Well, you have so, to keep it interesting here. Oh, no question. So the the first one has to be um, Zeppelin. Okay. You no, know, just it just greatest album ever written, right? Sure. I, I think it's um, Van Halen one. Ooh, like it. Van Halen one is just like unbelievable. Right. Um, Agreed. I'm trying to remember which one it was that I, I'm tr I can't remember off the top of my head, but I'm going deep here now, man. But I think that Kiss's album from like <laughs> 74 or 75 is like, that was like amazing. Right. How many is that? Is that three? That's three. You're up to three. Oh, then for sure. Def Leppard Pyromania. Ooh, I like that. That okay. I, I mean, that's like four, but it, I think that one sort of ties with um, Billy Joel um okay uh best of okay but, um but That's the one sleeper in all of this that's right. like one of my favorite albums of all time is um the blues brothers soundtrack from the movie Ooh, all right it's got it's got like the all-star cast if you're a blues fan i mean it's like it's so hard to go five albums right well, i know because, but that's the whole point it has to be hard because like muddy waters is jumping in there for me and right you know, Diana Schur has this like great. It just anyway, dude. Those are my five. I'm sticking with it. That's right. my final answer. What well, about you? What are yours? Well, so th you know, as you can tell, this is something I think about often, uh, <laughs> and then just it's just the the, the the mental exercise of it that I love. Um, oh, by the way, Guns and Roses, GNR Live, oh, right, dude? Like, like it's this is not even fair. The Wall by by <laughs> Floyd. Anyway, I'm just so, Quadrophenia by the Who. Yeah, but you're you're way over the five, Glenn. You gotta. I'm sorry, it dude. <laughs> it hurts. Where's Kyle? I need Kyle Faglin and Cole Johnson right now. So, just those so, are my go-to. And, and Chris Setta. My my five. Okay, first one, and, and it's only it, I'm picking one album from each artist because I could have multiple from each artist. But for you two, I waffle back and forth between Octum Baby and um, the Joshua Tree. It's not and, even close. And, and I, I settle on Octung Baby. Oh. Oh, oh, no, listen. Look, uh, Joshua Tree, right? It's it, it's their opus. You know, I, I get it. But Octung Baby is uh, was avant-garde. Yeah. It, 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 I relate to it with just, you know, just kind of – you hear that opening riff with, uh, you know, it, it with Zoo Station, and it's just it, – it makes my my spine tingle, right? It's just great. Then, then I'll and, – And I think it made an Apple commercial, didn't it? Uh, not that one. That, was that, that not was, Octum Baby? That was not Octum Baby. That was uh, um, a not Beautiful Day. It was – it was a, a, two or three albums ago, but Octum Baby is, is for me is, is you two. Then I'll pivot to Grateful Dead, uh, Dick's Picks, Volume Six. They had the the, the <laughs> second album has Scarlet Fire into Estimated Eyes of the World. That is like an hour long. That when I'm on a plane, I just put it on and I get so much writing done. It's incredible. I'm embarrassed to admit I was never really a Dead fan. I couldn't do it. Well, it's. It, it takes a certain type of person, I suppose. I agree. But, but I agree. It, it got me through dental school. Just that in Seinfeld got me through dental school. Just relaxing. <laughs> Same here. <laughs> just relaxing through it all. Uh, Black Crows, the Southern um, Southern Harmony and Musical Companion. That album with the. It, it's not just the the background singers, but if you listen to the recording, you can tell. They're all in the studio together in the same room. Like there's a depth to the recording that is uh, lost, I think, in today's um, uh, record industry. Uh, nice. So I love that. I love The Killers, Sam Town, Sam's Town. That's which, great. Which yeah. is, again, just, you know, great um, modern rock and roll, uh, slightly irreverent. And um, it, it's just great. And then finally, 
Rush moving pictures. Oh God, yes. You know, just why Y Z. Oh, that that is like as a, a middle schooler listening to this for oh, the first my time. God. Red Barchetta. My, my mind was just altered and expanded infinitely. Uh, listening Man, to this stuff. so. Those are the go-tos when I'm driving back and forth to the office, when I'm driving to a lecture, I just put them on, I turn off the news, turn that on, and I just go back to my childhood. That was really good. You know, I love that. And, you know, the worst part about it is, like, now I'm thinking about, like, all the albums that are just remarkable, like Bob Marley's Greatest Hits. Right. Right. Like, Glenn, Glenn, you had your chance, man. I know. I'm, I'm gonna, tonight it'll be like four in the morning. I'll be awake. I'll be like, oh, no doubt. Right. I remember that one album or, right. you know, what was I, what the out, outcast, right? Offspring, the offspring, offspring. the offspring. Like, I'm going to be thinking of all these albums for the last 30 years. Right. So thanks for screwing up my sleep tonight, dude. No problem. Happy, um, happy to help. So that. now I'm asking you 10 quick questions because yes, we've been sir. going at this so long that people had to have driven from like, Austin to Dallas during the time of this interview. That's okay. Um, but here you go. You ready? And you've listened before, so you know i got 10 questions coming. Right. And these are the same 10 questions that James Lipton from Inside the Actor's Studio asked every one of his award-winning right. guests. And you are my award-winning guest this evening. Well, thank so, you. Ready? Here yes, we go. Sir. What is your favorite word? My favorite word is a sweep -a. Are you familiar with a sweep -a? <laughs> I am, but it's not pronounced that. <laughs> well, well it, it, it's Spanish for asswipe. And, and so, I, and I, so I, I use it all the time, like in code when I'm talking under my breath or, or, or to with my wife about somebody, you know, he's a real a sweep -a. And that's a, might... it's a great, that's a Saturday Night Live skit back <laughs> I, there. I, I you know, know that one? I know. I love I know. that. So it, it's just, I, I love using it and it's just one of my favorite words. That is a great word, a sweet bay. Um, <laughs> that was when they were fighting over the baby's name. And he kept saying, well, if you name him this, they're going to say this. If you name this, they say, well, what's your name? A sweet bay. Uh, what is your least favorite word? Uh, no. <laughs> God, I just don't like no, you know. And uh, as you've heard over the last hour plus, it's uh, I, I oftentimes use it to uh, to produce results otherwise. Yep. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, or emotionally? What turns me on? I think um, creating and, and doing something that I never thought before was possible. Right. And, and so whether it's extruding a high cuspid with plastic, whether it's, uh, of course, I'm relating it to orthodontics, but uh, just creating and doing something that I thought was never possible. You know, I never thought I'd get married. I was at a point in my life where I was, you know, uh, happy to be a bachelor for the rest of my life. And boom, met my wife. Uh, and 11 months later, we uh, got married. And here I am with three amazing kids and amazing wife. And uh, uh, that turns me on when I sit back from time to time and just kind of drink it all in when my kids are playing the piano and listening to them. And I'm like, wow, look at where I am. You know, amazing. it's it's, uh, it's great stuff. It's amazing. So what turns you off? Uh, negativity. Yep. Um, j just people being negative for, for no good reason. What's your favorite curse word? Fuck. Why? <laughs> Why is it? I mean, it, it is. It's like the Smurf of, of curse words. <laughs> you know, you can use it, you know, in any it can It can be a great. That, that's fucking amazing. Or what yeah. a fucking asshole or or. You know, go fuck yourself. You know, uh, you know, he's smurferific. I mean, it's like the smurf of curse words. You can use it, you know, however you want to in, in any given scenario. You know, I recommend that anybody who likes that word go see the George Carlin skit that he right. did on all the uses of it as a noun, an <laughs> adverb, right. an adjective, right? <laughs> you know, it's like amazing. He said you can, and he uses it in a sentence as every single like a pronoun, right, it's right. great. Derivative, sure. Exactly. So uh, what sound or noise do you love? Oh, my goodness. Um, has to be when the, the, the visceral laughter and giggle that my kids have when I'm like tickling them or when they're laughing mm. with each other, that is a sound that is just, um, I can't help but put a smile on my face. And what noise or sound do you hate? Uh, what sound do I hate? I have to say, 
Um, mm. I hate when my uh, the 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 whining and the crying that my kids do for no reason when they're just when they've had enough and they're trying to get their way. Like that stuff doesn't fly with me, and it just it it, it just it mm-hmm. turns me. It flips a switch, and I become a different person when I hear that stuff. I'm never going to do that to you, ever. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Oh, I've been talking about this for years. I, if I were not an orthodontist, I would be a meteorologist. Seriously? And, oh, my gosh, yeah. I want to be on, <laughs> I want to be on TV. In, in Philadelphia, there's one of my favorite people is Glenn Hurricane Schwartz on NBC10. And he's this little nerdy guy, wears a bow tie. I bumped into him once going to Vegas on a plane. And you would have thought I saw like Tom Cruise. Like I was like giddy like a schoolgirl. My wife's like, what are you doing? I'm like, there's Hurricane Schwartz, right? And 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 so <laughs> you know, Hurricane, he, Hurricane those are Schwartz. Two, those are two names that don't go together. <laughs> Hurricane so, Schwartz. Schwartz. Right. And so my nickname would be, you know, in, in the Northeast here, we have storms and we call them Nor'easters. And right. I would be Nor'easter Nicosesis. That would be <laughs> my name as a, as a, uh, a weather person. I'm Nor'easter Nicosesis, <laughs> and that was your WPVI <laughs> yes. weather update. <laughs> <laughs> See, now you get it. <laughs> yes. Back to you, John. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and what profession would you not like to do? I would not want to do root canals. Seriously? Like, oh my gosh! Loathed them in in dental school. Like, I just I cannot stand, couldn't stand them then. The thought of doing them now is just uh, uh, makes my skin crawl. <laughs> and last but not least, mm-hmm. if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Uh well, I do believe that it does exist, and. Um, Nice. I would like to to hear him say, Jonathan, your Yaya and Babu are all over here. I, uh, those are my grandparents, grandmother and grandfather. I've only met uh, two of them in my life, but um, it is on the shoulders of those giants that I am where I am today. And I can go on for another half hour about their stories. But uh, uh, that's what I look forward to uh, to, to hearing. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being our guest today. I know we went for a while, but I know. Well, thank you, Glenn. This is an oh, honor, please. truly. Oh, honor's all mine. Um, and again, um, thank you for being that voice, uh, sometimes polarizing voice in orthodontics that, you know, you put yourself out there with a subject matter that some people find uh, controversial. Sure. And, and I really appreciate you being out there because without folks like you, uh, folks like me would not be doing some of the things we're doing. And so, you know, in any technology adoption curve, you need to have your pioneers. And I really appreciate you being out there. So some of us laggards can jump on board at some later date. And great. Well, just thank keep up you, the buddy. great work. Oh, my pleasure. And again, uh, for those of you out there who've not taken the Aligner Tensum Fellowship, uh, I would strongly recommend you consider doing it. Uh, it changed the way I looked at things. And I have no doubt it'll change the way you look at things. And uh, there are no better teachers out there than Jonathan Nikazesis and Maz Moshiri, um, great, great human beings. So with that, I have to push this one button, Jonathan, because yeah. I said I had to use it once because on this platform, they give you these weird buttons and I'm going to try this. You ready? Yes, sir. <laughs> Charge. Charge. Beautiful. <laughs> and with that, we are done. Wishing you the best. Looking forward to seeing you at AO and hearing you speak. And to everybody else out there, if there's anything you need from me, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm always here for you and have a great evening.